One of the things about history is that it is very often told as a narrative, a story that captures and distills out the essential elements of a complicated series of events in order to make the larger forces and trends stand out from the smaller and less consequential things. While this distillation makes comprehending the history easier, I think it has some drawbacks. The first of these is that some of the smaller or lesser known stories are pretty interesting in their own right and probably deserve more attention than they receive, especially if they illustrate important points or processes in the topics being discovered. Stories like that of Joseph Black in his early work in pneumatic chemistry can help us understand something like Robert Boyle's implementation of Francis Bacon's scientific method, which of course led to enormous progress in moving from alchemy to chemistry, but only if they aren't overshadowed by the stories about Priestley, Cavendish, and Lavoisier. The second drawback is that the narrative that emerges oftentimes reflects only the views or values of the person or group that writes the story. When I learned about the history of the Adam in high school, it was an Anglo-centric perspective that looked only at the contributions of Dalton, Thompson, and Rutherford that dominated the curriculum. I wasn't taught much about Curie, and Nagaoka was never discussed, and so the foundational work that they did in understanding the nature of matter was generally neglected. This is not to diminish the work of the British scientists, but rather to suggest that there's a richness in not so simplifying the story that the diversity of ideas is ignored. One of the negative consequences of this is to portray science as an endlessly linear march of progress with no dead ends, mistakes, or incorrect ideas. It makes the doing of science seem too easy and too logical and too inevitable. In the typical narrative, Dalton figures out the atoms in its entirety with no mistakes. It's like the fully formed Aphrodite emerging from the head of Jupiter. What we know, of course, is that Dalton's atomic theory had the big pieces right, but there were errors in the model that would take many years to correct, with work being done by many other very capable scientists. Not acknowledging that complexity and process can become very discouraging to those trying to learn the process of doing science and who don't have ideas just jump right out of their heads with every detail in place. The narrative of quantum mechanics and the quantum atom is just such a story. The physicists who came just after Bohr, by and large, shaped the initial narrative. This was added to by later generations of physicists who forgot or neglected the contributions of those outside of the conversation that would take place between 1900 and 1932. While the development of quantum theory is a striking tale of the power of physics to reduce complex phenomena to mathematically expressed physical laws, thus fulfilling Galileo's vision of doing science, far too often it ignores the contributions from chemistry and other fields that were profoundly important. While it is correct that quantum theory will produce the most successful models of the atom, it would be a mistake to see this development as obvious or inevitable. What I'd like to do in this podcast is consider the developments in atomic theory outside of the Cambridge to Manchester to Copenhagen narrative, as well as move forward to understand why the work of Bohr would be overthrown in 1925, setting off a reimagining of the very nature of the universe in which we live. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 14, Beyond Bohr. So let's rewind to 1902. J.J. J. Thompson has discovered the electron, and he, along with William Thompson, Lord Kelvin as he's better known, have begun the development of the plum pudding model of the atom. While this is taking place, a young American chemist is giving thought to just why do chemical reactions take place the way they do? Why do some elements prefer to combine with other elements, for example? 
The idea of valency offered some clues, as did the ionic hypotheses of Arrhenius. But what was really causing all of the combining of atoms into something? As we mentioned in an earlier podcast, while it's not so hard to imagine breaking matter down into atoms, it's a lot harder to take atoms and build molecules out of them and then bigger chunks out of the molecules. By the way, if you're listening to the podcast in a place where you can have a periodic table handy, you might find that rather useful right now. Now, no fair peeking if you're driving, but if you're doing chores or some such, pull a periodic table up on your phone or go to the podcast website and look at the periodic table that I've got there. We'll wait. Okay, so you've got it. Great. The young chemist's name was Gilbert Newton Lewis. Born in New England, brought up in Nebraska, educated first in Germany and then at Harvard, Lewis was a prodigy who earned his doctorate in chemistry in his early 20s. While at Harvard, Lewis was trying to figure out how to teach some particularly difficult chemical concepts to undergraduate students. While wrestling with the material, he realized that chemical reactivity had sort of a pattern to it. Certain atoms, those we call noble gases, aren't very reactive. Actually, they're almost not reactive at all. If you're looking at a periodic table, they're the ones all the way to the right, starting with helium at the top, and moving down through neon, argon, and so forth. What Lewis noticed is that if you start with helium, you have to go another eight places on the periodic table to get neon, and then another eight to get to argon. However, if you're just one more or one less space over on the periodic table than either of these, then you get an element that's really, really reactive. For example, neon's not reactive at all. But if you move one place back on the table, you get fluorine, which likes to react with a lot of stuff. And if you move one forward on the table, you get sodium, which is also very, very reactive. This pattern repeats itself eight places back with helium, hydrogen, and lithium, and eight places forward with argon, chlorine, and potassium. See it there on the table? Excellent. As you get further away from the noble gas column, or group as it's called in chemistry, things get less reactive and the elements have higher valency, meaning that those atoms seem to want to combine with a greater number of other atoms. Again, as an example, both fluorine and sodium are reactive, but only seem to really want to combine with one other atom, where carbon and silicon are much less reactive But those atoms, individually, seem to combine with a larger number of other atoms to form molecules. What Lewis realized was that he could explain this pattern by thinking about electrons filling up layers. The first layer would have two spaces for electrons, but the next two layers would have eight spaces. If one sort of assumed that by moving to the right on the periodic table one place, a single electron was being added, then an electron would be added to that layer. Lewis imagined that these layers would be configured as a cube. If you think about a cube, it has eight corners. So when you think of neon as an atom, Lewis said that it has two electrons in its first layer, and then eight electrons in its second layer, one each at each corner of the cube. Fluorine, one back in the table, only had seven electrons in that second layer, which left one corner of the cube empty. Sodium, on the other hand, which was one place forward on the table, and which Lewis said had one more electron than neon, would have to start a new layer, and thus would have one electron only at one corner of a new outer cube. Now while this is interesting, simple patterns do not a hypothesis make, though they can be a strong guide. What other evidence did Lewis have to support this idea? First, he recognized that certain ions had an inherent stability to them. When he examined these ions, he found that they were those elements that would have had electrons added or removed so that their outermost layer would have all of the corners of the cube filled. This led him to propose what is known as the rule of eight, or sometimes it's called the octet rule, that said that atoms or ions with a filled layer of eight electrons were extra, extra stable. Thus, If an atom had extra electrons, or missing electrons, it would either want to give those extra electrons up to get back to a filled layer, or acquire more electrons to fill an unfilled layer. Hence, an atom like sodium, 
which only had that one extra electron in its outer layer, would want to give that up so it could get back to having eight electrons in a filled outer layer. This would give it a net positive charge. Chlorine, which was one space lower in the periodic table than the noble gas argon, would want to gain an electron to fill that last spot in its outermost layer, and thus, when it did so, it would become negatively charged. Before we move forward here, I think a bit of commentary is in order. While this all seems rather straightforward to us now, Lewis's idea was thought of almost a decade before Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus and the following work of Bohr and Moseley. When Lewis was thinking of this model, Thomson and Nagaoka didn't really have much of an idea of how many electrons were in an atom. Thomson's model, as we mentioned, did rely on a physical analogy with the floating magnet experiments, but when Thomson tried to reconcile it with the periodic structure of the order in the elements, he didn't have a lot of luck. The reason I think Lewis was more successful than the physicists in moving towards a more accurate model of electron structure was that while they were much more interested in trying to understand how line spectra were produced, Lewis was guided by the physical and chemical evidence enshrined in the periodic table. Unfortunately, while Lewis did use the model in his teaching, he was discouraged from publishing his ideas by his graduate advisor at Harvard, who felt that it was little more than speculation. Hence, while we have Lewis's dated notes establishing his priority of thinking, the wider scientific community was denied access to his ideas for over 10 years. In that time, the experimental group at Manchester would establish the nuclear model, something implicit in Lewis's description of the atom. Now, after a decade of teaching, first at Harvard and then at MIT, Lewis was hired by the University of California at Berkeley to become the chair of the chemistry department there. Up to that point, the institution had allowed the chemistry department to become neglected, and Lewis was hired to bring it up to standard by bringing in top-notch teachers to build a group that would produce world-class chemists. During this time, an English student, Alfred Parson, was visiting the Berkeley department on a one-year fellowship. Parson was working on a paper wherein he suggested that a chemical bond was actually the result of two atoms sharing a pair of electrons in some way. As these ideas were shared within the department at Berkeley, things clicked in the mind of Lewis. This brings us to the second piece of evidence to support Lewis's layered structure. Lewis recognized that bonding would take place when an atom shared an edge of its outer cube in order to complete another atom's outer cube layer, and had its layer completed in turn. This is a hard thing to describe, so I'll post a diagram from Lewis's notes to just illustrate this at the podcast website. What Lewis was now able to do is offer a solid explanation of how bonding took place in atoms. He published a seminal paper on the topic in 1916, just a few months after German chemist Walther Kossel independently published a paper stating that atoms gained or lost electrons to achieve the same configuration as a noble gas, something Lewis had already puzzled out in 1902, but had failed to publish due to that opposition from his advisor. Lewis's bonding theory was especially effective in explaining what he called polar bonds, but what we now actually call ionic bonds. Using our example of sodium and chlorine from before, sodium doesn't want that extra electron in it sitting out there in its own individual outer layer, and chlorine does want an electron so that it can fill up that last spot in its outer layer. By giving up its extra electron to the chlorine atom, the sodium atom obtains the electron configuration of neon, while the chlorine atom gets to look like argon. These two charged ions now bond because of their mutual electrostatic attraction, forming sodium chloride, or what we call regular table salt. Lewis was able to cleanly explain the affinity of all elements in the two groups on the left-hand side of the periodic table, what are called the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals, to bond with elements from the next to last group on the right side of the table, sometimes called the halogens. When I teach this idea to my classes, I call it grand theft electron, as the chlorine more or less steals the electron from the sodium, but then it gets captured by it. The theory also had other strengths. The cube sharing framework of the theory allowed Lewis to explain bonds that weren't as strong as ionic bonds. In the case of oxygen, 
each oxygen atom would have two open slots in its outermost cubes. By sharing two of its electrons with another oxygen atom and being able to, in turn, sort of share two of that atom's electrons back, the two shared electron pairs formed bonds. We now call these bonds covalent. In the case where two pairs of electrons are shared, as with diatomic oxygen, or O2, we call this a double covalent bond. Lewis developed a shorthand notation for this that he taught his students, known, as, known now as dot notation or Lewis structures, that is still a standard way of representing this idea when teaching students the basics of chemical bonding. Additionally, he coined the term odd molecule for those cases where an electron is not shared. This is now referred to as a free radical, something that is often discussed in biochemistry and molecular biology. So why don't we know more about Lewis, and why doesn't his story make it into the narrative? Part of the reason for this has to do with Lewis himself. He was a notoriously poor communicator, especially in large group. He hated lecturing, and so he was loath to put his ideas forward in the typical conference settings we discussed way back in the first series of the podcast. Moreover, he wasn't a particularly pleasant guy. He tended to be jealous, hold grudges, and become resentful. He was something of a rebel who occasionally went out of his way to flaunt the rules and regulations that accompany academic and scientific life. Secondly, his seminal paper was published right in the middle of World War I. As we've mentioned, there wasn't a whole lot of scientific discussion taking place on an international scale during those years. Lewis himself would go to France when the United States entered the war as a major in the Chemical Warfare Division. Finally, as powerful as his model of the atom was, the electron structure he proposed was wrong. As you may have already surmised, the electron structure was a static one, wherein the electrons didn't move. Not only was this not physically possible, it didn't suggest an explanation for the observations of line spectra. Additionally, the model failed to explain a number of reactions, most notably those involving nitrogen. Here again, we clearly see one of the aspects of a model. It simplifies in order to explain what the scientist is trying to figure out, often at the expense of other important aspects of the physical system. Rutherford's nuclear model explained his scattering data, but not much else. The Bohr planetary model, which predated Lewis's publication by about three years, was excellent at explaining how single electron atoms produce line spectra, but it didn't explain bonding at all. Lewis's cubic model, working from the periodic table, was great at explaining both the structure of the table and bonding, but it was seriously deficient in providing a physically realistic description of the electron structure or an accounting for line spectra. While Lewis wasn't a good advocate for his model, another chemist soon took up the cause. Irvine Langmuir was a truly brilliant industrial chemist who worked in research and development for General Electric. Already famous for solving several problems with the incandescent light bulb, Langmuir published a paper in 1919 that pulled together many of the threads of atomic theory floating around at the time. Most importantly, he brought together the work of Mosley on atomic number, Bohr on electron energy levels, and Lewis in the layered bonding theory. His paper broke little new ground, but it represented a strongly coherent synthesis of each of the models through the abandonment of Lewis's static cubes for Bohr's dynamic electron orbitals. As Mosley's experiments had shown that the periodic table represented an inordinal increase in numerical positive charge in the nucleus as one moved to the right in the table, Langmuir was able to advance Lewis's idea of electron shell filling with the recognition that the atom's chemical properties were determined by the electron configuration. As Langmuir was a much better communicator and a generally more likable guy than Lewis, he was able to get the shared pair bond ideas into the scientific dialogue. The biggest upshot of this was in organic chemistry, 
where a number of organic reactions could now be much more easily explained in terms of pairs of electrons moving around the molecule. Linus Pauling would win his Nobel Prize in Chemistry by expanding on Lewis and Langmuir's ideas of chemical bonding in organic compounds. Additionally, the model allowed for chemists to be able to predict what kinds of reactions would take place and what the characteristics of those reactions would be, thus moving chemical synthesis out of the realm of trial and error to something more analytical. While Lewis initially resented Langmuir's appropriation of his ideas, Langmuir was always careful to give Lewis credit and priority in his presentations, and the two soon resolved their differences and became friends of a sort. Now, while Lewis was developing his model and getting it published, things were not sitting still on the other side of the Atlantic. With Bohr's trilogy, Rutherford's nuclear model had been enhanced to include, for the first time, a pretty good description of electron structure, at least for single electron atoms such as hydrogen and singly ionized helium. Bohr's inclusion of the idea of quantized quantities was a break with purely classical ideas of the motion of objects, but not a complete one. While Bohr's model worked in the simplest cases, it was not as successful when trying to explain multiple electron atoms or the Zeeman effect, a spectral line splitting into multiple closely spaced lines in high strength magnetic fields. To remedy this second problem, Arnold Sommerfeld reworked Bohr's model to allow first for elliptical electron orbits and then different orbit shapes altogether. He showed that there was another physical quantity that was quantized. Now when an object moves, one of the physical quantities it is said to have is called momentum. For objects traveling in a straight line, this quantity is the product of the object's mass and its velocity, which is how fast the object is moving and in what direction. When an object is traveling along a circular path, a similar calculation can be done for something called the angular momentum of the system. For an electron, or anything really, traveling in that circular path, the magnitude or size of its angular momentum remains constant. In Bohr's model of the atom, the electron orbits were determined by the energy of the electron around the nucleus. What Sommerfeld said was that in addition to the energy being quantized, the angular momentum had to come in even multiples of a constant called Planck's constant. Each energy level would have the energy level's quantum number n minus 1 values of the orbital quantum number as Sommerfeld's number came to be called. In the case of the lowest energy level, n equals 1, only one value of the orbital quantum number was allowed as n minus 1 equals 0. However, as the energy level increased, the greater value of n allowed for more values of the orbital quantum number corresponding to different shapes of the orbital in the model. For n equals 2, the orbital quantum number could be 1, 0, and negative 1. While the Bohr-Sommerfeld model worked in the simplest cases, it was not as successful when trying to explain those harder things that we talked about before. To remedy this second problem, Sommerfeld continued to work with Bohr to further refine this reworked model. Chemist John Main Smith was able to show that there had to be a third quantized quantity that represented the orientation of an orbital with respect to an axis in order to explain the observed data in both optical and X-ray spectroscopy, and his work was incorporated into the model. So, two notes here. First, we're getting to the point where it gets really hard to describe the specifics of the model without breaking out a lot of math and specialized knowledge. As I said in the setting out episode of the podcast, I'm trying to aim this at a general audience. So from here on out, I may have to resort to more vague descriptions of what's being discussed or just report the results with less scientific justification than I'd otherwise like. This is going to become especially true on our next episode. Second, what was it that was pushing first Bohr and then Sommerfeld in these directions of creating a more and more complex model? As I've mentioned previously, 
there are two things that are invo informing the scientific investigation, atomic line spectra and the periodic table. Bohr is not only trying to explain the line spectra, but he's also trying to describe why the periodic table looks the way it does. Why are elements in various groups, or columns, so alike chemically? And why are the periods, or rows, set up the way they are? Like Lewis, Bohr came up with the idea that as one moves to larger numbers on the periodic table, one must gain electrons in order to balance the increasing nuclear positive charge. As Lewis did, he began to look towards a shell filling idea with electrons filling in shells and building up an electron configuration. The outermost electrons in the configuration would determine the chemical and spectral properties of the element. In some ways, this model was like the Lewis Langmuir model, but it had one very important difference. In the Lewis model, the electrons were stationary at the corners of the cube while, as we've mentioned previously, they were moving dynamically in Bohr's model. One of the questions I've had is how much were the ideas of each man known to the other? What I've been able to determine is that they knew of each other's models. In an interview for the Oral History Project at the American Institute of Physics, Nobel Prize laureate Harold Urey someone who worked with both Lewis and Bohr as a graduate student, said that Lewis was absolutely opposed to the Bohr model at first, until one day he became convinced through an examination of hydrogen and helium spectra. For his part, Bohr doesn't seem to have given much thought to Lewis's model, as he rejected static electrons from the outset. As for the ideas of a central nucleus and layered electron configurations, both men seem to have come up with their ideas independently of each other. Lewis from chemical consideration, and Bohr, at least initially, from physical ones. Now why do I say initially? As Bohr puts forward his model, he seeks to be able to explain both the spectra and the table. In doing so, he uses the data from both to inform the specifics of his model. His first attempts to lay out how the fillings of shells takes place in the model are found in the trilogy papers and a second attempt can be found in both the series of lectures he gave in 1922 and papers published at about the same time. In these papers, we clearly see the intuitive bent of Bohr's mind and that he doesn't really have an analytical basis for his determinations in many cases. This was originally a source of great frustration for the German students, who were taught a fundamentally different approach to solving physical problems. Over time, however, they came to see the power of Bohr's approach but they kind of remained uncomfortable with it for quite a long time. Bohr often used the very spectra and chemical properties he was trying to explain to justify those explanations in a process that at least to the German schools of physics was far too circular. Nevertheless, the ability of Bohr to rely on intuition to guide his work would prove to be vital in just a few years. The problem was that the model was really struggling to explain complex atoms even with the addition in 1923 of a fourth quantum number, something we call spin, and Wolfgang Pauli's development of something known as the exclusion principle, which allowed for a much better explanation for the shell orbital filling process. Put forward in 1924, Pauli's exclusion principle said that no two electrons in an atom's orbital structure could have the same set of now four quantum numbers. This explained why all of the electrons didn't just settle into the lowest energy orbital, and it gave a way to fill the orbitals that was consistent with the structure of the periodic table. The way Pauli arrived at the principle, however, was based on a faulty assumption, something that was conveniently overlooked because the principle worked to bring the model into better agreement with the data. I should say here that I'm leaving out a number of contributors to this discussion. There's just not enough time in the podcast to get into all the nitty-gritty details without having to slow the plane to stall speed to bring back a metaphor from early in the series. This is not meant to minimize the work of these researchers, and those who are interested in finding out more can do so from Eric Sherry's book, The Periodic Table, or Helga Kraw's book, Niels Bohr and the Quantum Atom, The Bohr Model of Atomic Structure, 1913-1925. to 1925. By 1925, it was recognized that the model now contained so many paradoxes and ad hoc fixes that it needed to be reconsidered on a very deep and fundamental level. Obviously, it had parts right, 
and it was a big step in the right direction, but it just couldn't be taken any further without major revision. That task would fall to the students of Sommerfeld, Born, and others, who would fundamentally alter how we see matter. It would be a French nobleman by the name of Louis, however, who would take the first step in this reconsideration. Now, as always, thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you like what you hear, let your friends know about us. Leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher, and if you have a question or comment you'd like me to address, leave me a note at the website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. So until next time, full sails on your journey.